So first of all, congratulations on getting selected for a voucher. Now what? Like you've been waiting two months. What has to happen from here? What do we do? That's really my goal. So this is our agenda for today. We're going to talk about the fact that you need a real pre-approval letter. What you got from your lender is not what you need to actually submit with an offer. So what you got when you submitted your voucher request is not a full pre-approval letter. I'll explain the difference. The next step you got to do is pick a realtor. We're going to talk about types of homes because the type of home that you pick matters for sure. And then we're going to talk about um, new construction. A lot of people are asking about new construction. Is it a good way to do it or not? I'll explain some of the pros and cons of going new construction. We're going to discuss the three main ways to use the money. So three ways to use the money. And we'll explain uh, uh, in general which of those three categories uh, you get to pick from. We'll talk about what money you need out of pocket. So a big question people have been asking is, hey, John, I, I obviously this is my first home that I purchased. I have no idea what happens from here and, and what money does Dream for All cover and what money do I have to pay for? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what happens if you don't find a home in time. We're going to talk about what if you find problems during inspections and we're talking about buying a foreclosure or a short sale. And then I'll end with more time for Q&A. So at any point in time, if you have questions, post them into chat. I am recording this. I'll send this back out to everybody so that you have a copy of the recording and can watch it again if there's parts that you want to rewatch. But let's go ahead and dive right in right now. The first thing I want to say before I go any further is I forgot to put in my PowerPoint. You need to get education. Now, what type of education you need to get? You need to get education through, there's two types of education that are necessary. And let me show you on my screen. So let's go, first of all, um, eHome America, CalHAPA. So you can Google eHome America, CalHAPA, and it goes comes right here, CalHAPA eHome America. This is the um, uh, down payment, or this is the education required that it costs you $100. It is good for a year. So if you did it last year, it has to be within one year of closing escrow. So the date on your certificate cannot be more than one year ago from the date that you close escrow. And so you go here. Um, oh, hey, they're given a free education. Hey, it's uh, free. So you see a home 24 at checkout to get this limited time offer. They said it was only in June, but hey, give it a shot. So uh, anyway, um, go here. So just Google CalHAFA eHome America. And uh, I guess put in the coupon code CA Home 24 at checkout to get this limited time offer. That was worth the price of admission for every one of you. All right. So you get started here. You pay the 100 bucks or you use the, the, the coupon and you, you don't pay the 100 bucks. This is an eight hour course. Doesn't take eight hours. It takes maybe an hour or two online. And then you schedule a meeting, virtual meeting with a counselor where you have a phone conversation with that counselor. It is critical that you work on getting that done soon. Last year, this was a major backup. I don't think it's going to be a major backup, but you have a voucher now. You need to get your education done. There is another education course that CalHAFA has under the Dream for All um, page. So if you come in here and you go, doo -doo -doo -doo, maybe they moved it. Um, anyway, in here, uh, where did they put? Oh, here we go. California Dream for All. And... Next steps, I talked about all of that, shared appreciation. There is, I'll send you the link, but basically this one's easy. It's a half hour, it's online, it's free, it's easy to do. Um, I think it's under next steps, maybe, I'm not positive. Anyway, uh, we'll make sure to get it out to you, but it is, uh, it is shared appreciation education. So that is the education that really teaches you about how the Dream for All program works. What is shared appreciation? What are you getting yourself into? So that's an important one, but that's easy and it's all virtual and quick. The one with eHome America is the one that's going to take time. And that's the one that I want you to start working on right away. All right. So you need a real pre-approval letter. The letter that was provided a few months ago was on Cal Hafa's letterhead. And it was specifically for the purpose of, of entering into the drawing. If you read that letter, it says that you must re-qualify at the time that you are going into contract. Well, we've got to make sure that nothing has changed in the last two to four or five months since you did your initial review. So whether you did the review with me or you didn't do it with me, we have to update everything. Credit reports are good for four months, 120 days from the time it is pulled to the day you close escrow and get your keys. 
If it's 121 days, we have to pull a new credit report at the end, which could create surprises. So the credit reports that we would have pulled this spring are either expired or about to expire. So we're gonna update your credit report and we're gonna wanna do a hard credit report now because you have 90 days to use your voucher and the hard credit's good for 120, which means you can reserve your home sometime in that 90 days and you still have an extra 30 days on your timeline of the credit report. So you don't have to worry about pulling multiple credit reports. You're simply going to use the one that we have now. And as long as you find and get into contract in that 90 day timeline, then you don't need to pull in your credit report. We want to pull it now instead of waiting until you're in escrow, because what if something accidentally changed? What if there's a new collection that popped up that you didn't know about that's not your fault, but you need time to fix it? You don't want to wait until September 15th and you go into escrow and you find out you have a problem. So now is the time that we need to do that. And it's critical that you make sure to make that happen. All right. We're going to need to update your income, paycheck stubs, bank statements, tax returns. And if employment has changed at all since the time that you filed, then it is going, we need to update all of that as well. And we have to revalidate that you meet the income limits for the county you are trying to buy in. Now, the income limits have either stayed the same or gone up. So there has not been a decrease in income limits. So if you qualified the first time, you're fine, unless you got a pay stub, a pay increase. One of my clients is in Los Angeles County. She got accepted for the Dream for All in Los Angeles County. The limit's 155,000. She made 153, she was fine. She got a $3,000 a year raise. She now makes 156. We're trying to figure out a way to get her rounded down to a lower number. But just realize a pay raise, we're using your pay right now, not what you made last year only, not what you had on the Dream for All voucher uh, pre approval letter, but your income at the time that you buy the home also has to meet the income limits. Again, I'm going to encourage you all if you have questions about anything, please post them into chat now. I'll either answer them immediately or I'll answer them as I get to the information in the presentation. But I wanna make sure that I'm giving you uh, ample time to ask questions um, and uh, really help guide you through this process and make it as interactive as I possibly can. All right, step two, you need to find a realtor. If you haven't found a realtor yet, you need to find one now. Now, how do you pick a realtor? The realtor's job is to help you find the home, to help you negotiate with the seller to come up with a price and then help to oversee the inspections and all of the contractual details to get you successfully to the end of the transaction. My job is to get you the money. So they find you the house, they help negotiate the house, I get you the money. So it's critical that you pick a great realtor that you can trust, okay? Now, first place I would suggest to go is friends and family. Find out from your friends and family, hey, who did you use as a real estate agent and did you like them? Would you use them again? Tell me what were the pros and cons of using them and how, how, did, how good did they take care of you? You can look at online reviews. Get a feel from other people that have worked with that realtor, what they think of the realtor. And just like how you'd pick a restaurant when you go on to Yelp, you'd pick a, a realtor sometimes by looking at online reviews. And you can ask me. I know realtors all up and down the states. Um, most of the realtors I know are just based on people that I've worked with in the past or a connection with the realtor I've worked with in the past. So if it's local in the Central Valley where I'm in Sacramento and, 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 and the Central Valley, I know a lot of realtors in this market. In other markets, I know a few. I know somebody pretty much in every market, but I wouldn't start with me. I would start with who you have friends and family that connected you. And then if you still can't find anybody and you don't know through online reviews, then absolutely I'm happy to help provide you with a recommendation. Now, this second point is really critical. This is something that if you don't know, you need to know. And that is, how is your realtor paid? Now, why is this important? Because there was a lawsuit. And the National Association of Realtors got sued a few years ago. In October 31st of 2023, the jury ruled against the realtors and said, you guys have not been clear to buyers and sellers about how your commission works. And it's got to change. And so they're changing the rules right now, literally as we speak. They're, they're rewriting how the rules are going to work. And it's going to change how you do business with a real estate agent. Now, you've never done business with a realtor because you're a first time home buyer. But you may have heard from family and friends. You may not even understand how your realtor gets paid. So let me explain it to you. 
Historically, you're going to stop sharing here for a second. Historically, your real estate agent was paid by the seller of the home. So you hire a realtor and say, hey, I want you to help me find a home. And they say, great, no problem. And you say, what do I owe you? They said, nothing. The seller pays for me. That's been the truth. That's been the truth since the early 90s. Why? Because the seller would sign a contract with their agent that says, hey, I'm going to pay this much money. You keep some of it to represent me as a seller and you give some of it to the agent representing the buyer. Why did the seller want to do that? Because they're the ones that had the most uh, profit in the transaction. Buyers, most buyers have very little money coming into it and they don't have extra money to pay for their realtor. So the system was worked out where the seller said, I'll pay for it. I'll just build it into my numbers and I'll pay for it. But that became a bit of a challenge through this court process saying, you know what? The buyer is the one that's being represented and the seller is having to pay for it. It's kind of like going to court and being told that, hey, by the way, when you're going to court, you got to pay for not only your own attorney, but you got to pay for the attorney representing the other guy. That doesn't seem very fair. So here's what's going to be different. The seller can still choose to offer you money to pay for your real estate agent, but it's a choice and it comes after you've agreed how much you're going to pay your realtor. So before you start working, it's effective August 17th, but most realtors are doing it now. So don't be surprised that what's going to happen is to work with a realtor, they're going to have you sign a form called a buyer broker agreement. That is the agreement between you as the buyer and them as the, your broker that they agree to represent you in buying a home. And you agree that if you buy a home anytime in the next X amount of time, typically it's six months in a particular region, make sure that they wrote a region on there. Like, are they representing if you buy anywhere in the state of California? Probably not. So you'll want to have a listed like certain counties or certain cities. If you buy in a different county, then you might want to pick a realtor local in that county. You wouldn't want to have an agreement with a realtor in LA County if you're buying in Riverside because you'd want to use a realtor in Riverside County instead. So you have the right to push back a little bit to the realtor and say, hey, I want our agreement to be based on just this county or based on these cities and you're agreeing to how much you're going to pay them. Now, typically it's been anywhere from two to two and a half to 3% of the purchase price that the agent representing the buyer gets paid. So now you're going to have to negotiate with that agent and they're going to say, well, I'm worth X amount of dollars. You can decide if you agree or don't agree. For a lot of people, fine, that's I accept that. But you're agreeing that they're going to make that total amount of money regardless of what the seller is willing to pay. So if you said, hey, Mr. Realtor, what's it going to cost for me to work with you? And they said, it's going to cost 2% of the sales price. And you sign an agreement saying, yep, I agree to 2% of the sales price. and then. When you write an offer, before you write the offer, your realtor can pick up the phone and call the realtor representing the seller saying, hey, how much are you willing to pay to represent, to pay for my representation of the buyer? And the listing agent is going to say, we're willing to pay one and a half percent. Or they might say, we're willing to pay nothing. Or they might say, we're willing to pay three percent. But let's pretend you agreed to pay two percent. And the buyer, the seller agreed to pay one and a half you're responsible for the extra half a percent in fee. You are responsible to come out of that, out, come up with that out of pocket as a closing cost. So that's kind of scary. But you have the right to not write an offer on that home. If the seller says, I'm not paying anything for the real estate agent, then you can say, fine, then we're not going to write an offer on that house. You don't have to buy a home, but just understand, or you don't have to buy that home. But just understand that you're negotiating ahead of time to how much you're going to pay your realtor. And then you find out how much the seller was willing to pay your realtor. Okay. And at that point in time, if it's less, you owe the difference. Now, the unknown is what happens if it's more? That's negotiated. Does it go back to you as a credit towards your closing costs? Maybe. Does it go back in the pocket of the seller? Maybe it doesn't go to your realtor. That's the one key is your realtor can't make more than what you guys agreed to. They could technically agree to accept less than the agreement, but they can't keep any extra. So that's a huge change that you need to be aware of that lots of realtors are enacting now. All realtors have to have a signed agreement from you before showing you a property starting on August 17th. Just be aware it's coming up in a little bit over a month. 
and you're likely to be shopping for a home around that time if you don't find something sooner. All right, remember, if you have questions, feel free to put them into chat. I'm happy to answer your questions. We got a lot to cover and let's dive back in. Let's see if I can get this thing to share. Come on, share, there you go. All right, so let's keep going here. Again, don't forget, post anything in the chat that you have questions about. All right, so we talked about how to find a realtor. Type of home. So if you are out looking for a home, most people are looking for a single family home, just a regular home in a neighborhood with one family, one unit there. But there's some variations. There's a single family home that has a small house in the back called an accessory dwelling unit. Cal Hafa says you can buy that. You can buy a single family home that has an accessory dwelling unit in the back, but you can't count rental income from it. So if you have the desire, you can rent it out later, by the way, but you can't count rental income to qualify for the mortgage. But it's kind of a cool loophole. If you find a home or you search for a home that has an ADU in the back, you can generate some rental income from that. You can move a family member in there. You could put your, your adult children in there, uh, any number of different uses, but it is a loophole that you can buy a single family home with an accessory dwelling unit. But you cannot buy a multifamily property. Now, multifamily is considered two, three, or four units. Anything above four isn't even residential. So we don't even talk about that. But for Cal Hafa, they say, nope, you cannot buy a two, three, or four unit property. So what's the difference between a single family home with an accessory dwelling unit and a duplex? It's the appraiser's decision. But the most important thing is how was it born? In other words, if it was born as a single family home, built as a single family home, and then they added an ADU in the back later, the zoning is typically single family and they just allowed an accessory unit. But if it was born a duplex, the zoning is typically two unit. And it says that as the zoning for the type of construction, which is what leads the uh, appraiser to say, hey, this is a duplex, not a single family residence with an accessory dwelling unit. Now, condos are a great option for a lot of people. They're saying, hey, John, I kind of don't want to spend uh, uh, or, or can't find what I want at the price range that I'm at. And so I want to buy a condo. And that's fine. But you have to realize when you qualify for a dollar amount, you're actually qualifying for a payment, not a purchase price. So we take your income times a certain percentage, usually around 45 or 50%. That's how much you can spend on everything. House payments, credit cards, car payments, student loans, everything. And then we subtract the student loans and the car payments and the credit cards, and we're left over with how much you can spend on a house payment. We use that number to figure out, well, based on your down payment and today's interest rates, this is what you can qualify for as a purchase price. But if you add a homeowners association, then you have to lower your loan amount, which means you have to lower your purchase price in order to buy a home that has a homeowners association. And if it's a condo, be aware of the fact that the condominium project has to qualify also. On any other type of home, a single family home, even a manufactured home, I'll talk about in a second. The only thing that matters about the property is the condition of the property, that it's healthy uh, and livable with no health and safety issues. And the second thing that matters is the um, value of the property. But on a condo, there's one more thing that matters which is the financial health of the homeowners association. So there's extra steps that we have to go through that sometimes says we won't let you buy that condo because the homeowners association statistically does not appear to be as financially healthy as Fannie Mae requires them to be. So just understand buying a condo, you have an extra set of rules that you need to be aware of. All right. So Manufactured homes, you can also use Dream for All to buy a manufactured home, but it has to be on a permanent foundation on land that you own, and it has to be registered with the county as real estate. Sometimes you can take a manufactured home that's registered with the DMV, deliver it to a piece of land and put it on a permanent foundation. It's still not considered real estate because the home even though it's on land that you own, the land is considered bare land with the county because they never recorded the title transfer from the DMV to the county recorder's office. In California, that's called a 433A that's filed through the HCD, which is the Department of Housing and Community Development. 
That's a lot of jargon. Simply to say, if you're thinking about buying a manufactured home, you can do that, but it cannot be in a park where you're paying space rent. It's gotta be on land that you own and you cannot buy a new manufactured home to be delivered onto that land. You have to buy one that's already existing. All right, let's keep going. New construction. So what matters? Why does new construction matter? First of all, most new construction subdivisions have incentives and they say, hey, we're going to give you a really low interest rate if you buy in our subdivision. That doesn't apply to Dream for All because the builder's giving a low interest rate because you're getting the loan from the builder's lender and they are actually earning the interest on that loan for the life of the loan. But with CalHafa, the loan has to go to CalHafa which means the builder's not earning the interest on that. The builder's mortgage companies aren't earning the interest on that. And so they can't control the interest rate. So therefore you are going to um, have to either choose, do I want the low interest rate and not use dream for all or choose dream for all and you don't get the low interest rate. The second thing is they give seller credits sometimes and they sometimes require those seller credits to be used only if you use their in-house lender. Now, I want to be really clear. I've said a couple of times already. I'm going to say a couple of times again. I am interviewing for the job to be your lender. I want you to pick me if you have not already picked me. But if you've picked me and you end up buying a new construction home, I don't want you to pick me anymore if they're giving you money to pay for closing costs. And they tie that money to using their lender. Go with their lender. Go, I will freely help you. I'll give them all the information that I need. Go with their lender if their lender participates in Dream for All. Come back to me for your refinance. Come back to me for every loan you ever do in the future because I want what's best for you, which means if somebody else is best for you, I want you to go to them. For those of you who are not buying new construction and are not using me, I'm what's best for you. But if you are buying new construction, I'm not because they, if they're giving seller credits tied to using their lender, and their lender participates in Dream for All, use their lender. I want you to get the best deal and I want you to trust me forever. I want you to tell all your friends and family about me saying, John told me not to work with him. I'm telling you, don't work with me if you're buying a brand new home. But the last thing you gotta be aware of, and by the way, only, only don't work with me on a new home if they're giving seller credits that are big, that are tied to using their lender. The final thing is you have to worry about the rate lock period. I have a video that I'm going to be creating. I've written up all of the uh, details about it. I just haven't had a chance to record it. All about locking interest rates and how it works. I'm going to send it to all of you once I record it. It should be released next week about how rate locks work with CalHafa. Just understand if you're buying new construction, you have a longer period of time you have to lock that rates. And so you need to be aware of the extra cost of that long-term rate lock if you choose to buy using uh, the uh, buy a new construction home using your voucher. All right, it sounds like I'm either doing a great job or you guys are tired after a long day with 107 degree heat because there ain't no questions. And I had the same video yes yesterday morning and they had way more questions than you guys. So uh, hopefully I'm, I'm coming across and this is all making sense, but please, please, please ask questions because I want to make sure that I'm explaining it clearly. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is the three ways to use the money. So remember, you get 20% in assistance from the state, up to seven hundred, up to $150,000. So let's pretend you're not going over a $750,000 purchase price for the sake of, of this math. So you have to think about it and say, okay, let's pretend I'm buying a $500,000 home. I'm getting $100,000 from the state. So... Option number one says, I want the least amount of money out of my pocket. Well, that means that you're going to take the 100000 from the state and you're going to pull out some of that money to pay for closing costs, which means you no longer have 20% for a down payment. Now you're going to have mortgage insurance. But the cool thing is I have the ability to build the mortgage insurance into the loan as a one-time fee so that you don't have to pay it every single month going forward. So it's kind of a good best of both worlds. Last year, I helped nine people get the Dream for All program. Five of those people used option one. They did not come up with any extra money out of their pocket. They had the closing costs built into or taken out of the Dream for All money. And they just still had to pay some money. I'll show you in a couple of minutes what extra money they had to pay. 
but they had basically almost no money out of pocket. So that's option number one. Option number two is you say, okay, I'm buying a $500,000 home and I want to put the full $100,000 so or 20% towards down payment. So I'm gonna borrow 400 grand, but I gotta pay for the closing costs. Closing costs are anywhere from three and a half to 5% of the purchase price. Lots of reasons why it varies in between, but what I'll tell you is the closing costs on down payment assistance loans are greater than the closing costs when you don't use down payment assistance. And the answer is simple on why. Because banks get paid two ways. I kind of alluded to this earlier with the builder stuff. The first way banks get paid is we get paid an upfront fee. The second way banks get paid is in earning interest over the life of the loan by collecting a little bit of the interest payment as part of the servicing of the loan. And we make a little bit now and a little bit later. But with Dream for All, we have to sell the loan to CalHafa. CalHafa gets the servicing income every month over the life of the loan, which means the bank is only making money for what they charge up front, which is why the closing costs are higher because we don't make any money off of the servicing of the loan down the road. So hopefully that's a pretty simple explanation and that makes sense to you, but that is really why uh, we do it. And hopefully that helps you to kind of understand um, why the closing costs are gonna be a little bit higher than what they were if you don't use Dream for All. So budget between three and a half and 5% of your purchase price, which means that if you're buying a $500,000 home, you can say, okay, let's just call it 4% as a budget. That means I'm gonna have $20,000 in closing costs on this $500,000 home. So I'm gonna use the full $100,000 for down payment, and then I'm gonna pay the 20,000 in closing costs out of my pocket. That's option number two. Option number three says, I want the most amount of money out of my pocket that I can so that I have the lowest possible monthly payment. Cal Hafa says the most you can pay out of pocket is 5% of the purchase price plus your closing costs. So 5% of 500,000 is 25 grand. So that means that you'd put 100 grand down from the Dream for All assistance, you'd put 25,000 down from your pocket, your loan amount is $375,000. And then you pay the approximately $20,000 in closing costs. So that puts you at about $45,000 out of pocket. That's the most you're allowed to put out of pocket. You, CalHafa will not let you spend more than that, even if you wanted to, because they figure if you have more money to put for down payment, you shouldn't be using the voucher. You should be using your own down payment money. So hopefully that helps to make sense on that piece. And these are the simple three ways. As you talk to me during our one-on-one, -on -one, that's what's going to happen next is we're going to schedule a one-on-one -on -one with each one of you that are already working with me or those that are choosing to switch and work with me. We're going to have a one-on-one -on -one consultation. We're going to take a look at your income. We're going to take a look at your credit. We're going to take a look at your assets. We're going to make a decision based upon these three choices, but you can change your mind. It's not a final decision. It's your current decision. It's what you're thinking about today as your current choice so that I can structure the loan that way. We can always change our mind once we get into contract. We just need to know at the time that we're locking in your interest rate. All right. What money do you need out of pocket? So three things. First of all, your earnest money deposit. Your earnest money deposit is the money that you are paying up front to the seller to make sure the seller knows you're serious about buying the home. So if you said, hey, I want to buy your $500,000 house and I'm serious about buying your home. And so I'm going to give you $1. And if I change my mind and I don't buy your house and I don't have a good reason not to buy it, you can keep my dollar. That's how serious I am. You think a seller is going to take you seriously? They're not. Now, legally, you have to give at least a dollar. Most commonly, it's around 1% of your purchase price. Okay, so the issue is you have to put with that money at the time you're writing the offer and get the offer accepted. So the if the more your offering is earnest money, the better your offer looks to the seller. And that's a very important thing that has to happen is you and I and your realtor have to strategize together to say, how do we make your offer look better? A lot of sellers have kind of a negative feeling about Dream for All because last year, a lot of people got in the contract using Dream for All and couldn't finish the escrow because it ran out of money. So there's a little bit of a hangover there where sellers are feeling like, you know what? 
maybe I don't want to do this. Maybe it's a bad idea for me to accept this. So we've got to sweeten the pot, especially if you're in competition with other people, to make your offer look better. A higher earnest money deposit is one of the ways we can sweeten the pot. Another way we can sweeten the pot is by shortening the escrow periods. Another way is to lower your contingency timeframes. I'll tell you one of the ways that I'm going to help you is we're going to get a fully underwritten pre-approval for each one of you so that you can write your offer without a loan contingency. So a contingency, there's three of them right now. When they release the new forms, I understand there'll be a fourth one. But the three contingencies right now are loan contingency that says, hey, if John King's a schmuck and he lied and I don't qualify for this loan, then I can get cancel it and I can get my earnest money back. The second one is the inspection contingency. It says, hey, if I do a home inspection, if I do, that's all the things in step three of this slide. If I do a home inspection and I find problems and you, the seller, aren't willing to fix it, then I can cancel and I can get my earnest money back. The third one is the appraisal contingency and says, hey, I agreed to pay 500,000 for your home. And the appraiser says, we're both crazy and that houses in this neighborhood are selling for no more than 475. So I'm not willing to pay more than 475. So Mr. Seller, will you lower the price or should I go work with somebody else? Should I go find a different home to buy? And so if the house doesn't appraise or if there's issues on the appraisal, the seller won't rectify, then you can cancel based on your appraisal contingency and you can get your earnest money back. So the earnest money is applied towards the total amount you need at the end for down payment and closing costs. Now, let's look at the page before. This is page up, right? Perfect. Oops, I already did that. All right. So you're saying, John, I don't need any money for down payment and closing costs if I choose option number one. Then you get your earnest money back. So if you picked option one and we built all the money for the closing costs into the dream for all money, then your earnest money is refunded to you once you get the keys. You literally got the house for almost no money out of pocket. The only other things you have to pay for is the appraisal and credit report, which runs between $600 and $850 on average. And you have to pay for your inspection fees. Now you talk to your realtor about this, each inspection is anywhere from $300 to $750. And which inspections you need depends. Normally people will start with a home inspection, which is kind of a, a checkup by your general practitioner. And it says, let me look at you head to toe. In general, you look pretty good, but I'm kind of worried about your knee. So I want to send you to an orthopedist so he can check on that knee. And I'm kind of worried about your nasal passages. And so I'm going to refer you to an ear, nose, and throat doctor to look at your nasal passages. Well, that's the same thing that a home inspector is doing. Taking a look at the house from head to toe and saying, hey, I'm kind of worried about the chimney. I'm going to recommend a chimney inspection. And I'm a little bit nervous about termites. I'm seeing some evidence here that might be termites. I'm going to recommend that you get a termite inspection. Now you can wait for the home inspector's recommendation or you can order all of them up front. That's entirely up to you, but you're writing a check for every single one of those. And those fees are not included in what I'm quoting you in fees. They cannot be included in the Cal Hafa dream for all money. That is paid out of pocket. Even more important is if you cancel because you found out something in those reports, you still had to pay for the reports. Matter of fact, the reports are the reason you canceled. So you're paying for the information. You're not paying only if you complete the transaction. You pay nothing for me, nothing for your real estate agent, nothing for the title company or your insurance company, unless you buy the home. But you pay your appraiser, you pay for the credit report, and you pay for your inspections the moment that we order them, and that money's gone. You won't get it back even if you cancel and buy another house. You gotta pay for those things again, except for the credit report that does transfer over, but the appraisal and the home inspection and any other inspections you have to pay for again when you go to buy the other house. Okay, all right, again, feel free to post in the chat if you have any questions. So uh, what happens if I don't find a home in time? So this one's important. So Cal Hafa did talk about in their FAQ section of the portal for registration a couple months ago, a process for extensions. And in that process, they talked about the fact that you can get a 90-day extension and that you have to submit it to Cal Hafa and they'll give you an extension to your expiration date. But they didn't say under what circumstances. So I reached out to Cal Hafa last week on Friday and I said, hey, what are the rules on when we can get an extension? And they said, John, what makes you think we're offering extensions? I said, well, it says it in the FAQs that there's an extension offered. Oh, yeah, we weren't telling anybody that we were offering extensions because we haven't figured out under what circumstances we're going to offer them. 
So since you know, yeah, we are going to offer extensions, but we don't, we're not going to offer them to everybody. And we don't know what criteria we're going to use to decide who gets an extension. Now, what in the world does that mean? That means in my mind that the extensions are for people who maybe they wrote an offer on a home in, in August and, and had a problem with the inspection. And they wrote an offer on a home in September and they had a problem with the appraisal. And now here they are at the end of September and they've been trying and they've proven that they've tried to buy a house or two and they ran into some problems with the inspections. That's the circumstance that I think is logical and appropriate for them to give you an extension. But that's just my own opinion. If you're in a situation where you have not looked for a home at all and you've sat on your hands saying, I'm just hoping prices are going to fall and you get to the end of the 90 days, you're like, hey, can I have an extra 90 days to wait and hope that prices fall? I don't think you deserve an extension. Now, I have no idea who they're going to grant it to, but in my view, that's the difference between who they should and shouldn't give an extension to. So uh, Chitra says, uh, I'm traveling out of country for a month. Can that make a case for an extension? Maybe. So again, they did not tell us what they will allow for an extension. But logically, that's a good, that's a better explanation than somebody saying, I just couldn't find a house. Uh, I wouldn't count on it. But I would say if you get closer to like 60 days in, like you start hitting the end of August and you haven't found a home, and a big part is when are you traveling? But if you get to the end of August and you haven't found a home, I would submit for an extension and I would explain your case and see if they'll give it to you. I wouldn't count on the extension, but I think that's something that that is a logical explanation. Uh, and I think that it's just a matter they're going to take it on a case by case. You know, if there was a death in the family, hey, I, I had to leave the country because I, I had a family member pass away. I think those are kind of situations that that they would be even more likely to grant it if it's travel for business or pleasure, and you could have rearranged that travel, they might not grant the extension. And the other thing is you can actually buy a home remotely. You can buy a home from outside the country. Now, the hardest part is signing the documents because you have to sign them um, either, um, well, technically there is electronic notary now, but California is not really keen on it. Um, but technically you could sign a remote online notarization or you have to travel to a U.S. embassy and sign the paperwork at an embassy and then overnight it back from the embassy there, the original documents back to sign, to close. But with technology now, you can do a virtual tour with somebody. They can do a FaceTime video with you and walk you through the house. So I might think about trying to continue the home search even when you're traveling. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to miss out on your, your 90 day window hoping they're going to grant an extension. But if you've done everything you possibly can, and that is part of your argument of why you need an extension. I think that's worth trying. Okay, but please don't under don't take what I'm saying as as fact that you'll get approved for the extension. All right. So only a couple more slides. If you guys have questions, feel free to post them now. Um, I, I will have time for uh, questions at the end. Um, so what if I find problems during the inspections? So first of all, negotiate with the seller. The seller wants to sell the home to you, or they wouldn't have put it on the market. Once a seller has got an offer, their brain is in next house mode, okay? I know somebody, a, a close friend of mine, of, of my family, that is in that process and they're in contract now, right now to sell their home. And I know their brain is in next home mode. Like they just want the home that they're in to be done. They had it on the market, they got an offer, they accepted the offer, they wanna be out, okay? The, <laughs> um, I hate snakes, okay? Everybody tells you the snakes is scared of you as you are of them, it's probably more scared of you. I don't know if I believe that, but it's the same about sellers. Sellers are just as afraid of you canceling as you're afraid of them saying no. It's a fact. So negotiate with them. Talk to them about the problem and say, hey, what can we do to rectify this? I came up with this thing and I don't like it. Will you lower the price? Will you give me a seller credit? Will you throw in something extra? Negotiate. That's what a great realtor is going to do for you. So make sure you find a great realtor who has great negotiation skills because the seller wants to get rid of the house as much as you want to buy it. But if you find that you cannot resolve the problem, then cancel and start over with a new home. Just recognize you start over with a brand new rate lock. Your lock was based on that home, you as the borrower, and me as your lender. If any of those three things change, the rate lock goes away. If you're in escrow and you lock a loan with one lender and you don't like that lender, you can switch lenders. But Cal Hafa says you lose the interest rate you were at. Actually, actually, it's even worse. They say 
you get the worst of the rate you were locked at or the current rate. Because what they don't want is for you to switch lenders simply to get a lower interest rate if rates had fallen. So there's some loopholes that people have tried to walk through that you can't. So remember, if you cancel, you lose your rate lock and you still have to find a home before your voucher expiration date. Is it possible to get an extension? Maybe, but they haven't said who they're going to grant them to or why. Maybe they're only going to grant it if there was a death in the family or something like that. I don't know, but I'll tell you, don't bank on it. You need to focus on getting prepared to get out shopping as quickly as possible and then being aggressive in writing offers to find the right home and get into escrow within the right time frame. All right. This is my last slide, and then I've got uh, kind of time for Q&A. Uh, Kevin says, does CalHAFA allow purchases of townhomes? Yes, Kevin, and I apologize that I didn't put that in my slide. Townhomes are a, what's called a, it's a single family home, but it's called a planned unit development or a PUD. Yes, they do. So really the only things you can't buy is multifamily properties or mobile homes in a park. But you can buy a single family home, you can buy a townhome, you can buy a condo, and you can buy a manufactured home. Just remember with townhomes, there's a homeowners association. So we've got to budget that into our numbers when you and I meet. We've got to have a rough idea or leave enough wiggle room in your qualification to be able to account for that monthly homeowners association. All right. Last question that I want to cover is a big picture question is, can I buy a foreclosure or a short sale? I get this question a lot. The answer is yes, as long as it's not an auction that expects the money immediately. Now, what kind of an auction would expect money immediately? It would be an auction at the courthouse steps. When a home gets foreclosed, the actual bank, before they take ownership, has to auction it off. So the current owner owns the home. The bank files a notice of default and then a notice of trustee sale in the state of California. And then the house is sold at the courthouse steps at an auction. If you show up at that auction and you want to buy that house, you have to have cash. And not really cash, but you got to have cashier's checks. Like, it's kind of funny. People who are investors, they bring cashier's checks like you would bring dollar bills to the carnival. Like they literally show up with five $100,000 cashier's checks and five $50,000 cashier's checks, kind of like you'd bring in, you know, five $100 bills and, and five $50 bills and four $20 bills. Like they literally count out their cashier's checks as if they were about dollar bills. And that's how they buy hundreds of thousands of dollar homes. You don't get to see the home. You don't get to inspect the home. You don't get any recourse on the home. You buy it sight unseen at the courthouse steps. You cannot use the Dream for All money or any loan program to do that. So uh, while I see your question, um, so I will cover that in just a minute. I'll actually give you an example, a real life example of, of how that works. So you can buy a property that is a foreclosure as long as it is listed in the MLS and it is not an auction that requires cash up front. A short sale is a little bit harder because a short sale is misleading in its label. There is nothing short about a short sale. A short sale means the seller of the home owes more money than what the house is worth. So the seller really doesn't care what it sells for because the seller owes $600,000 and the house is selling right now for around five hundred. dollars Does the seller care whether it sells for four fifty dollars or five ten? dollars They don't. So the seller is going to take any offer they get, but then it's got to go to the bank and the bank has to agree to that price. And that can take 60 to 90 to 120 to 180 days for the bank to come back. And at that point in time, they come back and say, no, that 450 is not worth it. I, I, I'd rather foreclose on the home because I could sell it for 500. So I'll only move forward on this if you're willing to pay 500. Well, you're like, wait a second, I was in contract for 450 and my voucher's already expired. And so I can't, I can't make this work because I've got to buy this home and I don't qualify for 500. That's not fair. Well, it's because you weren't informed and you weren't prepared. So don't move forward with a short sale unless it's already been pre-approved by the bank for the price that you are offering. Okay, that's critical to understand. Otherwise, you run the risk of missing out on the money. All right, I'm going to get to YL's question in a second. I'm going to bring up this slide. If you are not already working with me, this is how you start working with me. So this is my direct pitch. I want to earn your business and hopefully the information that I've been providing to you has been enough for me to earn your business. If you continue to work with the lender that you're working with, that is your choice. If you feel like, you know what, I want to make the change to working with John. One person on this call, I think at least one, uh, already made that decision since they got their voucher saying, you know what, 
I do want to work with John. I really appreciate you making that decision and trusting me to guide you. And I'm asking each and every one of you to think about that and say, hey, do I feel like I'm in better hands with the lender that got me the pre-approval or am I in better hands with John and successfully navigating this? If you want to make a switch, this is how. So you click this QR, scan this QR code or go to apply.johnloanking.com and you start the application process from there. All right. So why Al said, can you explain more about the option for no money out of pocket and the one-time mortgage insurance payment? Absolutely. So let me, first of all, pull up my handy dandy computer screen and let me log in to our system. You guys should still, let's make sure you can see that screen. You can. Perfect. All right. So this is pulling up interest rates. Hopefully it won't require me to get a text message sent to me to validate my login. Uh, we're good. All right. So using the example we talked about, and I said, okay, so we're going to say you're putting, you're, you're only putting $75,000 of your $100,000 dream for all money for uh, down payment. And you're using the other 25,000 to pay for closing costs. So you're now borrowing 85% of the purchase price. Now, the biggest thing has to do with what your credit score is and what your debt to income ratio is, because that will make a very big difference in how much the mortgage insurance is. Cal Hafa says we give the same interest rate to everybody, no matter what your credit score is, no matter how big of your down payment, we give the same interest rate to everybody. But the mortgage insurance company does not. I'm looking for two check boxes as I'm talking. I'm looking for the one that says first time home buyer. There it is. And the answer is yes. And the other one that says community seconds. Community seconds. My brain is not finding. Oh, I didn't put a second mortgage. That's why. Okay. So I got to put the $100,000 second here. Perfect. Now it asks me if it's a community second. I'm going to say yes. Beautiful. And I'm going to do a bond program. And now we'll pull up Cal Hapa's interest rates. And We'll see that today's rates are around seven. It's got all different programs, but the do, 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 Cal Hafa, yep. So it expired because rates are only good through the, uh, we have to lock by 2.30 in the afternoon. So today's rate is <clears throat> um, 7%. And, <clears throat> excuse me, right here, I go to the mortgage insurance tab. So this is what I will do. We shop all of the mortgage insurance companies to find who's the best deal. So I'm going to say your, your, your debt ratio is 40 over 49, one borrower, 800 credit score. 40 over 49 means you're spending 40% of your income towards the house payment, 49% towards your total debt, including your car payment, credit cards, student loans, et cetera. So you pay mortgage insurance as a monthly fee. So that's $46 a month. If you have an 800 credit score, if you have a 750 credit score, instead of being $46 a month, you're going to pay, please wait, does this remind you of like the, the old Atari computer? Anyway, instead of paying $46, you're $49 a month. It's not that big of a difference, but if I went to a 701 credit score, now your mortgage insurance is going to be... $78 a month. Big jump when you have a lower credit score. So the mortgage insurance very much matters. Uh, the credit score matters and your debt to income ratio matters. But you don't have to pay $78 a month. You can pay it as a one-time fee. Now, in this case, that one-time fee is 0.6%, a little bit over a half a percent if you're at the lower end of the credit score range. If you're at the higher end of the credit score range, that one-time fee is a whole lot less. So it all obviously a lot of this depends on what your credit score is. You're less than a half a percent. So let me compare the math for you. We can add $1,657 to your loan fees, and then you don't pay mortgage insurance at all. Or you can pay $46 a month. So if we just do simple math and we say, what did I say that grand total was? $1,657. So I can pay $1,657 or $46 a month. So it's three years of break-even point. If you think you're going to have this loan longer than three years, then uh, you're having the mortgage insurance as a one-time fee is a better idea. If you think you're gonna get rid of it in less than two years, then you might be better off just paying monthly. But more importantly, it has to do with qualification. If this increase in your monthly payment stops you from qualifying, 
then building it into the fee is a smarter way because it helps you to not hurt your ability to qualify. Because at 20% down, you paid no mortgage insurance. At 15% down, you're borrowing more money and you're adding that to your payment. We're better off just adding it as a one-time fee. So while I hope that makes sense, uh, what's funny is this was the exact same question somebody asked me yesterday morning when I did my webinar yesterday for people who were uh, voucher winners. Um, and so I think that was something new that a lot of people didn't understand, but it is a very good option that I'm an expert in. And so I want to help guide you. Uh, as I said, I'm interviewing to help every single one of you. Uh, and if you choose not to use me, um, I I'll still answer your questions. And that's really what I'm here for. If you're choosing to use me, of course, I'm going to answer your questions and we're going to do a one-on-one. -on -one. So what happens next? If you have not already done so, you need to schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me. Go to the same landing page that you use to schedule this meeting. It's CaliforniaDreamForAll.info. So go to CaliforniaDreamForAll.info. That is my page. And you will see the links to schedule. If You'll see a link that says voucher winner. Click that you're a voucher winner. You go to the next page. Uh, we're going to be getting rid of these Zoom, Zoom calls because we're not doing these Zoom calls anymore. But you're going to have the option then to schedule a one-on-one. -on -one. That's when we're going to go through your qualifications. If you were pre-approved with me, then there's nothing you need to do between now and that one-on-one. -on -one. If you were not originally pre-approved with me, you're going to want to fill out the application using the QR code that's listed here. And then you're going to want to send me all of your income documentation so that I can have all of that in front of me when we do our one-on-one. -on -one. So again, my goal is to really help guide you and give you the best possible advice. Hopefully in the last hour, the last 53 minutes, I've done that and helping to answer your questions. Um, I want to, I'll stop sharing. And I'll simply say, uh, if you have a question, you can absolutely unmute yourself and you can ask me the question right now, or you can put it into chat. Otherwise, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me. And please know that I do all types of loans. So whether it's now, whether it's in the future, whether it's a family or friend, whether it is a refinance or a purchase, I pretty much do any type of mortgage loan that's out there. And my income, I, I do a lot of stuff on YouTube. I make no money at it. Okay, I'm not big enough on YouTube. You can certainly help me. I'm looking to try and get to a thousand subscribers. So if you can help me by subscribing to my Dream For All channel, uh, I would really appreciate that. But the truth is I get paid for doing mortgages. Um, and I love what I do, and I think I'm really good at it. And so I'd love the opportunity to help you out. Lyle, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, everybody else, if you don't have any other questions, I hope you enjoy your Tuesday evening. Try and stay cool. Have a safe and happy 4th of July. And I look forward to meeting with each and every one of you during our one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you all, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.